Hello and welcome to the e Crystal Palace podcast. I'm off on Greenbrook and today in pod 5 I'll be looking at a result of Tottenham Hotspur by bringing you my match review, player rankings and my man match. As well as this, I'm also going to be bringing you an exclusive interview with Alan Pardew and Wayne Hennessy after the game. So let's begin. <laughs> Victor Wanyama's header, eight minutes from time, was enough for Tottenham Hotspur to condemn the Eagles to defeat at White Hart Lane. Palace would accept to claim a deserved point after travelling across the capital and had some great opportunities to take the league throughout the contest. However, the Kenyan took his as he was on hand to turn in a flicking corner late in the game to deny Alan Pardew's men a point. Things began brightly for the visitors and the game was just a minute old when Scott Dan picked off Andres Townsend on the left with a racking pass and the ex-Spurs man also produced a wonderful pass to find Wilfred Zaha in the area. A good touch by the wing killed it dead and allowed him to tee up Jason Punchin but his drive was straight at Michael Vaughan. There was a major scare for the Eagles on 11 minutes when, a Spurs, when Spurs won a corner and Eric Lemanis' delivery was headed goalwards by Toby Aldred Reld but it struck Wayne Hennessy and away from danger and Vincent Janssen saw a curling effort drill, uh, drift just wide not long after. Another Lamella corner allowed Wanyama an opportunity to attack the ball, but just like Spurs' other summer signings, Janssen, it was well off target, as was another man who moved during the transfer window as Townsend bent a shot high and wide on a Palace for Trey forward. But the action was soon at the other end again, and the Eagles were saved three times by Hennessy as he pulled off a triple save. Harry Kane took aim from 30 yards and saw his effort clip Damien Delaney, causing the Palace keeper to scuffle across goal and keep it out. But Janssen was first to the rebound and it seemed dest- and he seemed destined to score, but the Welshman denied him before scuffing out his second attempt by the Dutchman. Pardew introduced Joran Kabai at half-time and the midfielder went close five minutes later when he took aim from 25 yards out and a bending shot that just flushed over the top. But once again Spurs came back at Palace and Kane got on the end of a cross with a diving header but the, the ball skipped just wide. Kabai then should have done better on the owl mark when Townsend weaved his way around the edge of the area and fizzed a low delivery across the box to pick out the Frenchman but he lashed his first time shot just over the bar. Midway through the second half, Spurs had another golden chance to take the lead when the freshly introduced Deli Alley played a beautiful first-time pass into the path of Janssen who broke clear and went one-on-one with Hennessy who rushed off his line. The striker lifted the ball over the keeper, however he watched it sail wide off the mark. The England man then rippled the top of the net with a swaying blast from the edge of the area but, then, but with seven minutes to go, Spurs managed to get themselves in front. The Mellon's corner was flicked on by Kane, and Wanyama was the quickest to react and a bullet header passed and put a bullet header past Wayne Hennessy. Scrambling to restore parity, Jason Punchin saw a half volley blocked after Zaha had burst down the flank, and Joe Ward could only turn a near post corner wide as the Eagles were forced to wait for their first point of the campaign. So obviously you've just heard the match report which just explains in a whole just the key uh, events from the game but like I did last week before I go on to the player rankings I'm just going to give you some positives and negatives from the game and obviously I'm not going to explain I've just written up a few paragraphs about the positives and the negatives just to tell you um, obviously the positives and the negatives from the game but another thing I'm going to do this week is I'm going to give you five things that we had learnt from the game and obviously that will give you an insight into what we can take from this game and how we can implement that to improve in the next Premier League game which is against Bournemouth and the next one which is the in the League Cup whatever it's called these days against Blackpool but the positives were Yoen Kabai made a telling difference to the side following his introduction to the game at half time which suggests he's nearing the match fitness that is far, which is so far seen being omitted from the starting lineup. Meanwhile, Chung Ng Lee once again proved that he's capable of playing in a drifting number 10 role, free of the defensive duties. Now to move on to the negatives. Like the defeat against West Brom, Palace failed to make any chances count against Tottenham, and Alan Pardew's men conceded another late goal. Whether it's the concentration or fitness that is lacking, the result is another defeat where a draw may have been a fairer income outcome. 
that the Premier League is brutal and it's ruthless. You have to take the opportunity given to you and make sure you're capable of shutting the opposition out in key situations. Unless Palace address this, address this weakness, little would change from the relegation threatening form that plagued us for the last five months or the 2015-16 to season. So there were just the positives and negatives we can take from the game. Obviously, the positives is the fact that Johan Kablai came on, he played very well and he should be up to match fitness now. So should be playing in our next game, uh, whether it be in the League Cup or whether it be his first uh, starting thing will be against Bournemouth in the, um, in the league. He did play very well and he just showed that he, is fl he has got full match fitness so he should be starting but he did add a bit more oomph to the team as well as putting in crucial tackles throughout the game. The same with Chung Ng Lee. Chung Ng Lee just playing down the middle rather on the wing but he was able to create a few chances, able to link up well with Townsend and Zaha, finding passes with them guys and also he was able to get back and do defensive work as well. And obviously as for the negatives, it's a right saying that now we've got Benteke we'll be able to score loads of goals. That wouldn't have helped us that day, we weren't able to supply Wickham whatsoever. And even when we had opportunities, the likes of Punchin's ones, Zaha's ones, uh, Townsend's one, we wasn't able to take them uh, to the best that we could have done because they either went wide or they got safe by the keeper. So maybe when we get these opportunities, we need to try a bit better with them and take them and think about it more before they strike the ball. But now to move on to five things that we've learned from the game. So the first one is Wayne Hennessy is thriving on the pressure of having a French international breathing down his neck. The big Welsh goalkeeper has pressure on him now Steve Mandanda has joined the club, but he appears to be thriving on it and is very with, sorry, with a very sound uh, display between the sticks. Made one point blank header to deny Toby Alderweireld with a header and then made a triple stop, palming out Her Harry Kane's deflected shot before getting up and well saving his shot from Vincent Janssen. And that was twice, obviously. The next thing to move on to is Zaha on the left, Townsend on the right. For the first 30 minutes of the match, Wilfred Zaha was on the right and Andrew Townsend back at White Hot Lane was on the right. They had little joy so swapped and Palace posed a little bit more of a threat, although in all honesty, neither on the top of their game. Benteke needs to have some service. Hi guys, it's Christian Benteke. I really look forward to play for you. Having said that about the two wide men, they need to get the ball into the box more. Both got on the ball down to their respective wings, but they rarely got a ball into the byline and sent the ball into the box. Corner Wickham held up the ball brilliantly, but never had any service from the wide. Benteke needs the ball coming into him if he is to be successful. Now let's move on to the next uh, thing to take from the game, and that is Kabai and Ledley need to play together. Joe Ledley has deemed fit enough to start the game following the, his Euro 2016 expectations. But Johan Kabai was named on the bench. After a medicure first half, Ledley was pulled off, replaced by Kabai. You can't help think that once those two partner up in the central midfield, Palace will have a base to which attack from. Jason Punchett and Chong Ng Lee did not cut it. And now to make the final thing that we've learnt from this game, and it's don't make substitutions when you're defending a corner. I thought everyone knew that there was an unwritten rule. Apparently not. Damien Delaney was injured as Spurs were about to take a corner, so Alan Pardew got ready to substitute him and Chong Ng Lee. Damien Delaney was livid. Two players came on, Palace were not set up for the corner and Kane headed goalwards for Victor Winyama to finish it off. So there you've now, they were the five uh, things we could take from the game. Obviously the first one being Hennessy, now we've got a, a world class striker, almost a very good keeper in at the club in Steve Mandanda, Wayne Hennessy is performing to his best of his ability because he knows that if he does one mistake, um, Steve Mandanda will be straight in there. So that's in fact just boosted his confidence in the fact that he needs to uh, perform better. As for Zaha and Townsend, they need to swap around a bit more. Uh, and like I said in the game, when Zaha started on the left and Townsend was on the right, they were a lot, lot better throughout the game. And that's what they need to do. They need to go on their stronger side so they can do it. And in saying that, they still weren't that good. But what they need to do is they need to put in a few more crosses into the area from the sides that they're most stronger with. And then they will turn and that will really help us to kick on our season. The other one was Benteke will score when he gets more service. So linking them with the wingers. The wingers weren't really getting the ball into the area much. So if he are, if Benteke is to be a success, which I believe he will be, but that's only if we supply more. So we need the likes of Zaha and Townsend just to get the ball into the area, even if they're not 
right by the byline. At least if they could cross it, maybe at half line, halfway line, just to get it to him in the box, then Wickham or Benteke, whoever's in the box, can just chip the ball out and try and have a shot on goal. But unless we supply them, there's no way we're going to score goals because these players in Wickham, Benteke, we need to supply them more. As for Kobay and Ledley, both of these players have played in the Euros, both were up to uh, uh, fitness levels. They both had the exact fitness levels you would expect of a player. And I want them to start together because Punchin doesn't really play a defensive role. So the fact that Pardew's playing him in that role, he makes him feel uncomfortable and he's not really playing to the best of his abilities. So why don't you put Kabai and Ledley in there? That way these players can make a lovely partnership here. They're both very good defensive players, so they can put in tackles, but also they're very good at getting forward, and we saw that with Kabai. He had a, a shot from 30 yards which just went wide, and Ledley, he was also very good at making runs into the area and finding a pass. So if these two can get together, we can certainly find a positive partnership until the Kabai and MacArthur partnership come to back. And the other one is, it's a bog standard thing I suppose, is that when you're defending a corner, don't make a substitution because the players who have just come on don't know how to set up and that's why we leaped in the goal. You know, Tal, um, Tompkins who came on, yes, it's not really his fault for the goal, but he wasn't really marking them, uh, he wasn't really marking um, Wanyama enough. So when the corner came in, Wanyama was just able to find the space and header it in. So maybe when the substitutions come on in the future, we need to make sure that they do know what they're doing or you just leave the player out and defend the corner with 10 men so you can clear it and then get the substitutions on so they know what to do in the game rather than being put under the pressure of having to defend the corner. But obviously you've just heard the positives, the negatives and five things we've learnt from the game. Now we're going to move on to the bog standard part of the podcast which is the player rankings. So now you've heard the match report and also the positive, negatives and five things we've learnt from the game. And we're now going to move on to the player rankings, which is the most bog standard part of the podcast where I just discuss some of the players' performances from the game. But before we start with the uh, player rankings, don't forget to follow us across social media on Twitter and Facebook at eCrystal Palace. Um, so you can join in, uh, find out the latest new, join in with conversations. And also, if you are on Facebook, check out our Facebook group. So once again, you can join in with conversations, read the latest news, and also after games, post your own opinions. But enough of that now. Now to move on to the player rankings. And today we're going to start with Wayne Hennessy in goal. And I'm going to give Wayne Hennessy a 6. Made a triple save in the first half to keep the score tied at 0-0. Although there is a case to be made that he struggles to dominate his six-yard box, it would be harsh to blame the goal on him. So Wayne Hennessy, I've given him a six because he did make that really awesome triple save throughout the game, which actually kept us in the game before half-time. He also made a few other saves throughout the game, obviously from the Wanyama corner, the first one. Headed it straight at him, he was able to parry it away. So he made some decent saves throughout the game, but obviously still we're seeing with him he's got a lack of ability to command and dominate his six-yard box. But to be honest, that didn't really affect his game because, like I said, he still made some wonderful saves throughout the game. But the only, you know, it would be harsh to blame the goal in him because it is a very good header from Minyama, a very powerful one. So even if he did get his hands on it and saved it, he probably would have been able to parry or header the re rebound in anyway. But, you know, a good performance for Wayne Hennessy made lovely crucial saves. But certainly after what I've seen... With Steve Mandanda in the youth games, he is going to have Steve Mandanda sniffing down his neck now for the first team goalkeeper in place. But I think that will keep Hennessy on his toes, trying to keep his place in the squad. But a very good performance from him. Now to move on to Joe Ward, who I'm going to give a 5. Tried to play the ball down the wing to Wilfred Zaha and Andrew Townsend when in possession, but struggled against an overlapping Danny Rose, who has the ability to cause problems for the most capable of fullbacks. So Joe Ward, like the West Brom game, didn't have the best game for us. Obviously, he tried his best to link up with Zaha and Andrew Townsend, which he did do better from what he did in the West Brom game. But, you know, he did struggle with uh, Danny Rose because, you know, he's a very uh, fast fullback who would try and get the ball off the player. And he did that. Joe Ward did get dispossessed quite a lot of times. Danny Rose come running up to him and did dis dispossess him a lot of times. And with the Danny Rose as fast as he is running towards him, Ward wasn't able to cope with the pressure. So he wasn't able to link up in them cases with Zaha and Townsend to get the ball away. And that's what caused the problems, the fact that we lost possession and the pace of 
uh, Danny Rose meant that he was able to make a run in the box and get across. But, you know, he didn't make the most uh, tackles, which we normally see from Joe Ward in games. But he certainly did put in a nice shift. You know, when he had to make a tackle, he did. But, honestly, he was probably one of the worst players on the pitch. And the fact that he looked a bit lost throughout the game, the fact that normally he would man-mark the full-back or the winger, which he's done all of our season very well. But this season, he was he was cutting inside to be a, a centre-back more often, which, yes, is good because we've got extra cover in the centre-back position, but we need him to run outside and mark the winger so they can't get the crosses in. And I think that's what resulted in us being under a lot of pressure against Tottenham, is the fact that the crosses kept coming in because the likes of Joe Ward and Papa Suare couldn't defend it very well. And yes, yeah, Joe Ward, maybe people say it's time for him to have a rest and maybe bring in Kelly. But I still think, give Joe Ward a few weeks to get back into the gist of things. And I think he'll go back to his normal sort of man-marking, defending crosses and also linking up well with the wingers. So not the best performance from Joe Ward, but hopefully we can see more of him in the coming weeks. Now to move on to Damien Delaney, and I'm going to give him a 7. He's the kind of defender to throw himself in front of chances to, present the opposition, to prevent the opposition from scoring. And for much of the first half, that seemed effective. Palace were severely hampered when, due to an ankle injury, they were forced to substitute Damien Delaney prior to the corner from which Tottenham scored, a move that Pardew later lamented in his, press, in his post-match news conference. So Damien Delaney, he was like a rock in the defence, and as soon as he went off, Tottenham scored. So am I surprised there? Not really, because he's normally very good at commanding his box, and looking back at the replay of the goal, Tompkins, who'd just come on the pitch, looked a bit... He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know who to mark. And, and you know, ultimately, he was meant to be marking Winyama, but didn't do it very well, and that's why they scored. But Damien Delaney was a rock in the defence, putting his body on the line to make blocks. And he made four or five decent blocks throughout the game. You know, Tottenham were putting a ball in or a cross in, whatever they were doing. Damien Delaney was able to put his body there and block it out. And you know what? It, it was very effective, you know, the fact that instead of going in for a tackle, you would get the pressure, soak in the pressure and then make a block, which was very good for Palace and it worked for us. But obviously when he got the ankle injury, he was very angry to be substituted because he wanted, as a rock, he wanted to carry on the game, which was would have been fun, you know. I would have rather he stayed on the pitch for the corner and then we headed it away and then substitute him off. But the fact that we substituted before the corner meant that the new two players coming on were a bit unorganised. They didn't know what they were doing and that resulted in the goal. But if we had had his presence in the box for that corner. We certainly probably would have probably would have defended that corner better because his commandingness and also the fact that he puts his body on the line would have meant that he probably would have headed that ball away, cleared it away and yeah, would have stopped them from scoring. But certainly Pardew identified that after the game and hopefully he will learn from that and not make that decision again. But certainly a very decent performance from the Rock in the defence in Damien Delaney. Now to move on to the captain in Scott Dan. And I'm, I am going to give him a 6. Easily the most reliable player in Palace's defensive line. He did little wrong for much of the game. Palace was stretched in the first half, but his organisation and a hint of luck ensured that Tottenham's dominance didn't count. So similar to uh, Damien Delaney in the fact that Scott Dan will put his body on the line, but unlike Damien Delaney, he doesn't do that that, more, that often. But what Dan will do, he will try and make a tackle, which he did very well, as well as making crucial blocks from corners. And he was able to be very good in the air in clearing crosses away. Also, when we had a few corners, he was able to get into the box. And whether it was the fact that the corner wasn't directed to where he wanted it to go, or the fact that they, uh, Scott Dan wasn't able to head over it, maybe worked to Tottenham's favour. The fact that D Scott Dan wasn't on the best of his headering abilities in the game against Tottenham. But certainly, he'd done a defensive job. We know what we can expect from Scott Dan, and he'd done exactly what we expected from him. Same with Damien Delaney. They were rocks in defence, put their bodies on the line to make tackles, to make blocks. And admittedly, probably should have at least drawn the game because them two were on... F they, they were the, probably the best players on the pitch. And, you know, his organisation as the captain is making sure that everyone knows what they're doing. And obviously, he made sure there was lots of organisation. But clearly, for the goal that we conceded, there was no organisation. But we can't really blame Dan for that because he wasn't there at the time. He wasn't the one def marking Wanyama. And also, the fact that he was good throughout the whole game meant that one little slip up didn't really affect his performance. Because overall, it was a very decent performance from the captain. And once again, we're seeing why he's been chosen for the captain 
because he was very, very commanding in his box. Now let's move on to Papa Soiree, and I am going to give him a 6. Like Ward, Soiree had a difficult game, but did reasonably well in a job of keeping Spurs at bay. If there was one persistent criticism of him, it's his lack of composure when in possession that showed again in this match. So Papa Soiree, similar to Ward in the fact that he wasn't very good defensively today, you know, he wasn't able to make blocks and stop crosses coming in. He wasn't able to make as many tackles as he would normally do. But certainly, he'd done an alright job considering that Spurs were got very, very fast players. And, and Suarez, unlike Ward, was able to cope with it very well. But the only thing with Suarez is that when he's in possession, normally you would see him run with the ball, try and link up with players, try and link up the winger. And he would try and run down the wing, maybe get a crossing. But this game against Tottenham, he didn't really do that. All he kept doing was when he was he was in possession and he waited so long to find a pass that he was under pressure. So the fact that he just had to keep passing it back. So maybe if Swai just maybe have taken a risk more and maybe run with the ball down the wing and linked up with the wingers, we would have seen more of an impact from him. And I think that would have been good for him. But certainly, you know, we didn't see the best of his defending abilities and attributes. The fact that he defended crosses blocked them. But, you know, it weren't exactly the worst performance for him, and he still put in a shift. And obviously that results in the fact that we only conceded one goal, which admittedly wasn't really his fault. But, you know, a good performance uh, from Soiree could have been more uh, offensive, or could have been more effective doing his defensive duties, i.e. making blocks, making tackles, but also... We know he can as a really good attacker, so maybe he could have showed more of his attacking attributes in the fact that he would uh, tackle more. Oh, sorry, in the fact that he would run down the wing, link up, link up with the wingers. But you know, a six is a, I think, a fair score for him. Now to move on to Jason Punchin, I am going to give Punchin a five. Similar to the game against West Brom, Punchin once again started in a deeper role, and as a result, lost some of the approach play we know he's capable of. Like Suarez, his composure went missing in that game. Like uh, for the first half at least, really passed him by. So you know, it's it's very similar to Suarez in the fact that when he was in, when he had possession, he wasn't able to do much with it. He would he would think about where to pass it, and by which time he finds the pass, he would be under pressure, and that's why we lost possession. But you know, Punchin is not a defensive midfielder. He's either an attacking midfielder obviously playing behind the striker or he's a winger so I don't know why Punch is playing in, in a defensive role because he isn't good at defending so why are you going to put him there and that resulted in not really getting the most opportunities in the game but if he had played further forward he probably would have been able like Lee Chun Yong to create more chances and supply the ball more but you know his composure did go throughout the game and I think that's the only reason that was is because he's playing defensive and he's not really used to that. And I think that's why he lost his composure. But certainly, if Punchin had been playing for forward and also had been uh, having more composure in the fact that he was able to find a pass and make more runs, he would have had a more effective performance. But in saying that, although he did go missing for parts of the game, he did link up well with Andros Townsend and Suarez when we were on the counter-attack because obviously he had to run from his defensive role further forward. But, you know, it was not the worst performance from Punchin, but certainly not the best judging by what we know he can do. Now to move on to a defensive midfielder in Joe Ledley. And I am going to give Joe Ledley a 5. So he did the defensive basics that were expected of him, but wasn't creative enough to tie the defence and attack together. Substituted for Kabai at half-time, and I think the only reason he was substituted, and I think Pardew came out and said this after the game, was the fact that he got a little niggly injury. So it wasn't the fact that he had, he had done anything wrong, and I think that's why I've given him a lower score, is the fact that he wasn't on the pitch long enough to make a massive impact on the game. But, you know, he done his defensive, duty, defensive duties very well. He was able to make tackles and also link up the attack as well because when he had the ball instead of doing what punching done and sort of panicking he would make a little run try and get past the player obviously where he's quite muscular you know push players off the ball and then he would find a pass and he'd done that very well but you know he was taken off at half time he didn't really have that much creativity Kabai came on had a totally totally changed the game in the fact that he was more creative but you know Joe Ledley he was on the pitch to be a defensive midfielder. That's what we expected for, off of him. And although he wasn't creative, he was still able to find a pass which the likes of Punchin in the defensive role couldn't do. But, you know, if he had been on the pitch long enough and hadn't have picked up that little niggly injury and was able to link up with Kabai, he probably would have got a higher score. Now to move on to last week's Man of the Match. 
nomination, and that is Chong Lee. And once again, he's had an absolutely blinding match. And I'm going to give Chong Lee a 7. The only player in the side capable of actually creating chances. He produced two of his teammates in the second half with that more, little more composure might have resulted in goals. With Kobai playing behind him, he seemed to be more potent too. So Chong Lee, once again, like the West Brom game, one of the nominations for Man of the Match. One of the best players on the pitch. Where he normally plays in the wing, he wasn't really that effective. But now Pardew, the last two games, has played him down the middle. We've seen what Chong Ong Lee can do. He's very good at creating chances. He's able to find a pass. He's also able to get the ball, run at players, hold up the ball well and wait for backup, which he's done very well. And obviously he did get two chances. He supplied two of his teammates in the second half um, with brilliant chances. Obviously Kabai didn't really uh, take his chance well. It just went wide. The other one, I can't remember who it was from, but certainly the fact that Chong Lee is supplying these chances, eventually something's going to happen and someone's going to score and Chong Lee is going to, and they're going to thank Chong Lee for supplying him. But certainly the fact that he was able to link up well with the wingers and the defensive midfielders was meant that we were able, on the few occasions we were able to get forward, he was able to pass the ball forward and link up the rest of the team. But I think when Kabai came on, he was more potent as well because he knew that he could push forward more and do his more attacking role in finding passes because he knew that Kabai was behind him making the tackles. And I think that really helped him, the fact that he was playing there. And I think if we were to drop a player for next week's game, I think and we should probably drop Punchin, play uh, Ledley and um, Kabai, like I said in the five things about the game, play them two together with Chong Lung Lee in front. And I think that would be a good partnership because it means that you've got two solid defender defensive players with someone who can rely on them to do the job so they can push on forward and I think Chong Lee done that very well and I think if he can carry on doing this he'll certainly uh, be re re um, certainly be keeping his place in the squad because the fact that he's able to one of the only players to create chances in the game means that why would you get rid of him when he's creating chances now to move on to Wafa Zaha who I am going to give a six. The focus of persistent and targeting fouling. It wasn't until the second half that Michael Oliver actually began to, to call fouls in his favour. Some of Zaha's problems were his, of his own creation. He needs to be more clinical in the final box in, with, the, with his final ball and less predictable when in possession. But his pace and aggression certainly caused problems. So obviously in the first half you, nothing really was able to come from Wilfred Zaha's chances because he was being man -marked, being marked by two players, kept getting fouled. He was getting a bit frustrated because nothing was coming off these fouls. But in the second half players were actually starting to get booked from him so he built, he built up his confidence throughout the game and was able to create more chances. But obviously he's not really creative, he needs to be trying and be more creative in the fact that Instead of just running at players, maybe you need to try and use your skill to actually cut inside rather than just running to the byline. Try doing that more often. And also it needs to be more clinical, you know. When he was in the box before, maybe just try and have a shot rather than trying to find a pass to someone who's marked by four people. And maybe if he tries to take these chances, it'd be better. But when he's in possession, when he's got the ball, like I said, instead of just running to the byline, use some of his tricks because we know he's got tricks and use them to be less predictable. And that way he will be able to get past players better. And that way either provide them or score more goals. But, you know, in the game, he was one of the best attacking threats in the fact that his pace was was meant that he was able to get past players and also his aggression certainly helped because when a player's coming running at him he would show his aggression to try and get past the players and on quite a lot of occasions three or four occasions he was clean running on goal um and he crossed the ball cross and obviously the player who he crossed it to couldn't do it more but you know certainly if he can sort of be more creative in the game and still have his pace and aggression i'm sure that he will be very very effective this season now for Colin Wickham, I am going to give him a 6. Highlighted by Pardew after the game, Wickham worked the channels as much as he did try to feed off the scraps given to him. But even new signing Christian Benteke would have struggled with the quality of service provided on Saturday. So obviously Colin Wickham playing in the middle again, like the West Brom game, didn't have didn't have the ball whatsoever no one supplied him and that's the thing that Andrews Townsend and Wolf Rizal need to consider they need to be crossing the ball into the box more because we know Connor Wickham has got very good headering ability and we did see that from a few corners he was able to head the ball down obviously nothing came from them 
But, you know, we need to exploit that. We need to get more crosses into the area so Conor Wickham can get on the end of them. And like it said there, Christian Benteke would not have been able to get anything from this game. Maybe he, because he's slightly faster, when he had the ball on the flank, he was able to cut inside and have a shot from 30 yards and sort of curl it in, which we've seen Benteke do. But other than that, if Benteke's role is to be the lone striker, I can't see how him being in that game would have been any difference because there was no crosses coming into Wick Wickham and that's why Wickham struggled. But he did work very well midly, you know, he tried to work off the scraps that he got given, tried to use the ball, do twists and turns to use the ball, but obviously they got cleared by Tottenham defenders. But certainly when he was playing out wide because he knew there was no service coming in, he was able to link up well with the likes of Townsend and, and Zaha, you know, running alongside them, doing one-two passing. And then he would try and cut inside and have a shot. And he did have a shot late on in the game. Nearly sneaked in the bottom right-hand corner with a lovely, powerful shot there. And uh, Vaughan just managed to save it. So, you know, when he's able to play out wide, if we can't get crosses into him, I think our second game plan, our play, uh, plan B, should be that we play with no striker, play with Wickham, sort of playing off one of the other wingers so we can cut inside and then sort of go into that striker role and have a shot. But certainly... A pretty decent performance for Conor Wickham, considering he didn't have, you know, he didn't have the opportunities which he should have had. Now to move on to fellow wing out to Wilfred Zaha, Andros Townsend. And I am going to give uh, uh, Andros Townsend a 6, even though this may be predictable. And like I said, if any of you do disagree with what I say, do comment below. And if you want to do, you can list... Um, all fifth, sorry, all fifteen, all eleven players from the game. And if you want to do the subs, if you really want, but I don't think you can really rate the subs. But if you want to do all eleven plays from the game and just write next to them each of the players' names, just the numbers and which you rate them, you know, so we can see what you think of, about the game and also see whether you agree with my opinion. And this is the one of the debatable ones, Andrew Townsend. But I'm going to give him a six. Perhaps he was overcome by the occasion by returning to his former club, or perhaps he's trying to find his feet in Palace's system. But Townsend struggled to create sufficient chances for himself and his teammates. More is expected of him during the rest of the season. So this wasn't one of Townsend's better games um, for Palace. Obviously, he's only had a few games, but we've seen what he can do in pre-season, and he didn't really do much more. And I think one of the things to pick up for his performance is the fact that, yes, Wickham didn't get supplied much, but I think one of the reasons he didn't get supplied it's caused quite a lot of occasions Andros Townsend went for glory. So instead of trying to do a cross into Wickham, which we know he can do, he can hit crosses with his left and right foot. He would try and have a shot from 30 yards, which yes, admittedly, some of them almost went in. But sometimes I think a cross is more sufficed, sufficed because, you know, you've got a striker in the box who can header it in. So if you can just get a decent cross in the area, they can header that down and we could have possibly scored. So in that respect, he was a bit greedy. But, you know, like Zaha, he used his pace and aggression to get past players, which he'd done on a few occasions. He linked up very well with Lee Chung Young, doing one-two passes. Um, he was able to find lovely passes on a few occasions, able to use his pace and run down the wing. And I don't know whether it's because he's tr still trying to fit into Palace's system or the fact that he's just had a bad game. But, you know, we know what he can do. He can run past players. Yes, he's more creative than Zaha in the fact that he'll try and dribble past players. But what he needs to try and do, instead of just going for glory... Just do a little cross, which we know he can do, and we would have had such a much, much better game if he had just crossed the ball in. But certainly, a good performance from Andrews Townsend, a pretty good attacking threat. But what we need to see from him more is the fact that if you are going to shoot, you need to cut inside more so it's more effective and also more crossing from him. But now to move on to the substitutions. Obviously, two substitutions. I'm not really going to give ratings because they were hardly on the pitch long enough. But James Tonkins, no rating, and Jordan Much, no rating. Obviously, Much was just one of these impact subs who didn't really make an impact. And Tompkin, you know, his debut didn't really go to the best starts because he came off of the injured Delaney and then we conceded it straight afterwards. But you can't really blame him for that because there was a bit of confusion because he'd just come on the pitch, weren't sure what to do, and that's why we conceded. But, you know, they weren't on the pitch long enough to make an impact, so there's no rating for them. But Yohan Kabai, I'm going to give Yohan Kabai a 7. One of the best players on the field and um, certainly one of the contenders for man of the match. Um, but he was brought on by Pardew to control Palace's midfield. Kabai had an instant calming effect on the side. Better in possession and what is transitioning the side from defence to attack. Kabai's only major fault was the, the failure to make a great chance when provided to him by Lee. So Kabai brought a lovely calming effect to Palace's midfield. Uh, came off for Joe Lindy, who was a bit slow and sluggish in the game. But Yohan Kabai added a bit more upbeat to the game. He was able to... 
uh, defend well. He was able to make crucial tackles, but also he linked up the defence with the attack very well. So instead of just doing long balls to the striker or to the wingers, what he would try and do, he would try and play down the middle, link up well with Lee Chung Young, try and do one, two passes there, try and get a ball out to the wing and try and do something different from what we were doing in the first half. And you know, he had a massive impact, calming impact on the game. He made us better in possession. So the likes of punching were much, much better in the second half. The fact that they, instead of, uh, sort of getting scared when in possession and just passing it anywhere. He made it more composed. They ha Palace held on to the ball better, had a lot more possession, and that ultimately led to us creating more chances. And yes, he should have done better with the chance provided by him for Lee, but considering no other players had a chance in the game, you can't really fault him for that because he's under a lot of pressure to score, and he could have done better, but, you know, we're going to look at it, the fact that he actually had a chance and at least he took it, whereas someone like Punchin had a shot straight at the keeper. But certainly, he was made, he was brought on to be an impact sub and he had a massive impact on the game. He kept it calm and, you know, he was able to do defensive and also offensive attacking roles. But there you have it. They were all of my uh, player rankings. If you, Like I said, if you do disagree with them or agree with them, do drop a comment below the video. And also you can tweet us at eCrystal Palace or also follow us on Facebook and comment on the pictures. But certainly an all-round better performance from the West Brom game from all the Palace boys. But certainly there are a few little things we need to pick up on for the next few games against Blackburn Bournemouth just to sort of improve us. But certainly end product needs to be finished and hopefully Benteke will bring that to us. But certainly... More crosses into the box, please, Palace. And we will certainly score more goals with the arrival of Christian Benteke. Now to move on to the Man of Match Ward. And like I say every week, if any of you do have a different opinion to me or just want to comment below on who you thought should have been on my shortlist for the Man of Match Ward, do comment below the video or just f uh, tweet us at eCrystal Palace so you can share your opinion on the game. But this week, it was very hard to come up with uh, four players who I personally thought were the best in the game. And there's been quite a lot of debate on Twitter, on, especially on my Twitter account, about who was the better player. And I think, looking back at it, I may have... Uh, not included someone who should have been on the list, but I think that these players were had the most impact on the game, and I'll go into explain why that is after I give you the uh, well, I give you the results of my Twitter poll. So in last place with 15% of the votes was Wilfred Zaha. In third place with 21% of the votes was Scott Dan. In second place with 30% of the votes is Wayne Hennessy, which means with 34% of the votes is Lee Chung Yong, and the winner of my a man of the match award against Tottenham Hotspur is Lee Chung Young. So congratulations, Lee Chung Young. You don't get a trophy or certificate or anything, but you do get my sincere congratulations for what was a very solid performance by you and a very good attacking one from you as well. But I'm just going to go through who I excluded from the man of the match award, and that was actually Yo and Kabai. And I had a few people tweet me saying why Kabai wasn't on there. And people saying that Chong Lee wasn't really that good. But Chong Lee obviously was good because he won the award. And he won the award because he linked up very well. He was probably our best attacking threat. The fact that he was able to, to supply players with opportunity. He was able to hold up the ball well. And also just to connect the defensive players with the attacking defensive players. And he'd done it very well. And the only reason I didn't include Kabai in that. Because Kabai probably had a similar game to Lee Chun Yong. In the fact that what he'd done with linking up both uh, sets of players is because he only came on at half time. So, although people said he should have won by a country mile, I didn't put him in there because these players had been on the pitch the whole time and had had an impact over the whole course of the game. Whereas, Yohan Kabai, yes, he was an impact sub and he had an impact. He was only on the field for 45 minutes, so he didn't he didn't have as much influence on the game as, say, Lee Chun Young did because he played the full 90 minutes. But certainly, I would have personally put uh, Kabai on there if he had performed the way he did in the second half if he was on the field for the whole time but just looking through the players Wayne Hennessy he came second the only re the reason he was on there is because he made some cracking saves throughout the game you can't really fault him for the goal and that's why he was on the shortlist obviously done very well because he uh, came second place and you know I think that's because he made some crucial tack uh, crucial tack made crucial blocks throughout the game and he's you know, fixing up from the mistakes he's made last season and the fact that he's now able to get down low from uh, shots outside the goal. 
And also he's able to make himself big when one-on-one with players. Obviously, Scott Dan, the reason he's on the shortlist is he's had a really solid defensive performance. Can't really fault him for the goal because he wasn't the one marking Wenyama. But, you know, he commanded the side well as the new captain, made sure everyone knew what they were doing. And like I said, tackles, blocks, he'd done all of that. Lee Shun Young, I've already discussed him. Very good attacking player, linking up both defence and attack very well. And Wilfred Zaha, you know, out of the attacking players, he was probably the one who had the most influence on the game or the most impact on the game because he was the one who was able to run up the channels. Yes, he didn't get the crosses in, but he was able to try and cut inside on a few occasions. He teed up, punching on one of them, punching obviously, shot right at the keeper. But the fact that, you know, instead of crossing it in, he just done a, you know, a little pass, simple football, like I said last week. He just put a little pass into the area and then punch and missed it or shot it straight at the keeper. So... Wilfred Zaha on there for being an attacking threat but personally for me looking back at the game now I'm probably going to say Scott Dan for being the best player and yes people may be shouting down my ear hole saying why have you picked not picked Kabai, Lee Chin Yong, Wayne Hennessy but the reason I picked Scott Dan is we almost kept a clean sheet in the fact that we kept a nil-nil draw and you've got to thank Scott Dan for that because he was absolutely amazing throughout the game he made lovely tackles lovely blocks and also you know, he commanded the side while as the captain. But certainly, you know, it's a very hard decision for me. You know, Kabai was brilliant. Lee Chun Young was brilliant. All of these players were really good. But I am going to give it to Scott Danson. Congratulations. You win my man of match award from Tottenham Hotspur. So, uh, congratulations. Like I said, like the Matt Twitter poll, you don't get a trophy or certificate. But you do get my sincere congratulations on winning my man of match award. But, you know, all in all, a very good performance from these five players. And it was very hard for me. But I think the reason Dan stood out is just plainly because he was absolutely solid throughout the game. And also where he was the captain, he made sure everyone knew what they were doing. But, you know, like I said at the, at the start of this section of the podcast, if you do have a different opinion to me or just want to comment below on who you thought the man of the match was, do drop a comment below the video or tweet us at eCrystal Palace so we can hear your opinion on who you thought the man of the match was against Tottenham Hotspur. So now you've heard my match report, player rankings and my man match. That concludes this week's podcast. Now I've got an exclusive interview with Alan Pardew and Wayne Hennessy following the game. Alan, thoughts on the game today? <laughs> well, uh, really galling really to have lost that game. You know, talking to the players about fighting and scrapping to take something away from games, even if we can't win them. And uh, they couldn't have done any more today. So unfortunate with the goal to lose Damo and have to make a substitution and... Uh, I felt for Tompkins a little bit. He was caught cold, got blocked in, and uh, they've managed to score. But um, a much better performance from us. Much more verve and endeavour in our play. And uh, that come, I think, from a little bit of Christian's arrival and a little bit of an uplift from last week. Our fans were great. I think they know we needed to make some changes, uh, and we're in the process of doing that. And uh, Penteke, <coughs> excuse me, will be a big step towards getting that goals for column that let us down today. Because um, if we'd have scored, I think we'd have definitely got a draw, if not a win. Uh, how important was it for Ledley, Tompkins and Johan to get some game time? Well, important. Uh, I wasn't expecting uh, Johan to come on at half-time, if I'm honest. But Joe had a knock, so we'll have to see how he is. And obviously, damo has got a knock. Um, so uh, hopefully, he'll be OK too. Wayne, a physical battle today and some great saves. What's your thoughts on the game? Yeah, it's, um, I thought we defended really well at times and we had our own chances. But um, like you're saying... They got key players, and, and um, at the moment it's set pieces that are letting us down right now. How frustrating was it to concede so late on? Yeah, like I was saying, we uh, we tried so hard, and we had, like I said, we had our own chances, and and I think we seem to improve and improve, especially attacking wise. And and again, it's just just a bit upsetting that obviously it's a set piece again. So yeah, we're a bit a bit devastated with that. You've had a shorter pre-season than some of the others, you're, but you're looking great. How are you feeling? Yeah, I feel really good. Um, I, say, I don't have to do as much running around as the rest of them, but um, no, I feel good. And like I say, I had a good Euros and looked after myself. So yeah, I felt feel really good to come straight back in. Looking ahead to next week, we've got a double game week. How important is it that the both games are at Selhurst? Yeah, like I saying, we have to put that game behind us now and 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 follow on Black Blackpool now and and then get hopefully get a win there and we can take it into the league, you know. And like I saying, hopefully we can start winning some, and getting some points and climbing up that board. Finally, the club announced Christian Beteke today. Are you looking forward to facing him in training? Yeah, he's um, he's a great player and, and a good target man. and I'm sure he'll do well at Crystal Palace and, and we, we can't wait for him to start.
So there you have it. Now you've heard what Alan Pardew and Wayne Hennessy had to say after the game. That concludes this week's podcast for the game against Tottenham Hotspur. But make sure to come back next week for my post-match review of the game against Blackpool in the Capital One Cup and also the Premier League game against Bournemouth. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop.